My name is uh, Juan Jose Bocanegra, and <clears throat> why I'm the moderator, I have no idea. No. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you know, such moderate views. <laughs> moderate views. Uh, J John uh, asked me, and it's been a long time since I've been dealing with housing issues and development issues, since my old downtown human service council days. But uh, I thought it would be a great uh, opportunity to touch base with a lot of the folks that I haven't seen in a long time. Um, and to me, it was kind of a an eye-opener when I started working on development issues because I had always worked on civil rights issues for years, farm worker issues, you know, human rights issues. And when I got into the whole development issues, I said, I've been in the wrong game all along. This is where the real action is. And they've just been distracting the shit out of us with this minority and, and civil rights crap and keep running, making everybody run around with their heads cut off. But the real money is in development, and the real money is in housing, and in the issues that affect the community, and that is, you know, our where we live, your home, and and so it was a real eye opener for me to have worked alongside with a lot of the folks that are here, um, and it's you know, and it's really good to kind of touch base again. I'm working on immigration rights again, but. You know, I always have that yearning to go back to development. So it's a good opportunity to come and talk to you folks. We have a great panel here this afternoon for you. Um, we're not just going to be talking about disasters. It's like, you know, it's not going to be totally like uh, tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes, none of that stuff. I mean, you're going to be going, going over a little bit of history, and many of you may kind of, you know, go like that. But uh, we have... Uh, Jeff Parrish, who's a journalist and political activist. Uh, Job wrote columns for nearly two decades extensively about city politics for Eat the State. Remember that? Eat the State. A publication he launched in the mid-90s that played a uniquely pivotal role in electing progressive Nick Licata. There's Nick right there. <laughs> He's with us. He has written numerous local and national publications such as The Weekly Stranger and In This Times and is well known for his insightful progressive take on local politics. He co-anchors with Maria Tomczyk, KEXP's Eat the Airwaves, writes a regular column for City Living and other Pacific publishing newspaper and his own blog, http slash forward slash forward geo dot org um, slash forward gp slash forward m. Uh, we also have Mark Worth, uh, journalist and activist in the U.S. and Europe for more than 30 years. While in Seattle in the 90s, he co-founded the Washington Free Press, focused on local and neighborhood politics, corporate accountability, and progressive movements. His article on chemically in injured workers at Boeing was awarded the nation's best magazine article by investigative reporters and editors. He wrote the Media Culpa column covering housing and corporate welfare for the Seattle Weekly including a groundbreaking piece entitled, Who Really Runs Seattle? Uh, there's a copy for you in, next to you. Uh, in 1998, living in Berlin, founder of the European Center for Whistleblower Rights and the South European Coalition on Whistleblower Protection, where he advises countries, the UN, EU, and APAC on the whistleblower protections, and they must have their hands full. Yeah. And we also have our very own local troublemaker, George Howland. Over the past 30 years, George has written and edited innumerable stories, winning many awards, being anthologized in books, opened hearts, and changed minds. Howland was the founding news editor with The Stranger, 1994 to 1999, and news and political editor of Seattle Weekly, 1999 to 2006, and later served as the interim assistant editor for Real Change. He is the author of many published works in books, magazine, newspapers, and textbooks, including The American Prospect, Seattle Post Intelligencer, The Progressive New Age Journal, High Country News, Extra, Seattle Magazine. Most recently, Howland has been a reporter for Outside City Hall, news site for the Seattle Displacement Coalition. And last but not least, Maria Tomczyk, born and raised in rural Pierce County, a Seattle resident for 35 years, Maria is a journalist and activist 
who's covered local politics here for 20 years. She appears on the weekly radio show, Eat the Airwaves, on KEXP 90.3 FM in Seattle. Her written work has appeared in Alternet, Znet, Common Dreams, Newswire, The Counterpunch, Website, MotherJones.com, and Antiwar.com. She is a former editor and contributing writer for Eat the State and a former page editor for Subtext. So, you know, that's the kind of caliber folks we have here for you guys. So listen, but I know you guys are like, anybody who works on development or follows development, highly opinionated folks, you know. So I, I don't think we're going to have any problem in getting some input from you folks. So why don't we go ahead and start with uh, my good buddy, Joe. Oh, we've got to push the button forward. There it is. Yeah. Okay. I'm Joff Parrish, and he, for some reason, I'm starting. Um, and I would add to my introduction, I'm also um, writing for South Seattle Emerald these days, have been for a while, and also as of last week for Outside City Hall, which I'm very happy to uh, join. And a uh, bunch of national stuff over the years, but. Um, a lot of us in this room, as well as up here, uh, lived through a lot of the things we're going to be talking about in the 90s. And the, the whole point of doing this is to remind us that uh, for all the crisis around affordable housing and rezoning and upzoning that we've, and gentrification that we face in Seattle today, a lot of these battles have been fought before many, many times. And we have lost some, but we've also won quite a few. And we can learn from both the successes and the failures that we've done in the past. Um, I've been assigned somewhat randomly the topic of um, the sports stadiums battles of the mid-90s. Um, and that, uh, that certainly is something that uh, even 20 years on, you find activists who are still pretty bitter about, honestly. Um, what happened with this was starting in the early 90s, the uh, then ownership of the Mariners uh, started talking about a new uh, stadium to replace the kingdom for Mariners games. Uh, they threatened to move in 1992 to Tampa St. Petersburg. They uh, uh, got to the ballot in, well, actually they first went to the state legislature in 1995 uh, trying to put together a tax package for a new stadium. The legislature wouldn't do it in early 1995. Instead, they kicked it to King County voters. So there was a special election on September 19th, 1995 for, for King County voters. And interestingly enough, there was also a second uh, ballot initiative on that same ballot in September 19th, 1995, and that was the Seattle Commons. Um, both the Seattle Commons and the Mariners Stadium were rejected by voters. Uh, and in the case of uh, in the case of the Mariners Stadium, not uh, wasn't particularly close. It was pretty close for the Commons, uh, which was a proposal uh, by uh, spearheaded by Paul Allen and Vulcan Ventures to build a, uh, a large uh, community park in the area that now hosts the Amazon uh, headquarters in South Lake Union. Uh, that was opposed, and the Mariners Stadium were opposed for basically the same reason, people objecting to giving uh, huge amounts of taxpayer dollars. In the case of the Mariners Stadium, it was uh, about $250 million uh, to a private business, and a, a fairly successful private business headed by extremely wealthy individuals who could well afford to be doing these projects themselves. But that's what they got rich, right, was by, by foisting their costs off on taxpayers while they kept the profits. Um, Paul Allen, of course, went on to develop that area. There, people were also worried about gentrification and that the, creating that park would drive up costs for the area around that park. Um, but the uh, the vote went to uh, voters, and they rejected those both. In the case of the Mariners, uh, they went to state legislature, and the state legislature approved it over the will of the voters, and that's how we got Safeco Field. That also prompted the Seahawks to demand a similar deal, and in 1997, in June, there was another vote um, that, uh, but this vote, they learned from it. Paul Allen, who was involved in the Commons, learned from those mistakes and from the mistakes of the Mariners, and so they had a statewide vote. Uh, the new uh, stadium for the Seahawks was approved, but it was uh, approved because it was a statewide vote. It was actually rejected in uh, King County, but uh, suburban Sammamish and Pierce County and some of the outlying areas approved it by more, and it very narrowly passed by state, uh, by state vote. 
So that's how we got those two stadiums. And now we're in an era where people want to uh, build a new stadium, or arena rather, for basketball. Uh, there's going to be a refurbishing, uh, or basketball or hockey, there's a refurbishing of a key arena that's underway that's being held up right now by an uh, uh, environmental impact statement lawsuit. So there's going to be uh, some battles over that as well, and have been. Uh, the original proposal by Chris Hansen was, uh, was rejected finally. Uh, but uh, they're, they're back with more, and these, these issues never quite go away. Um, our next speaker is Mark Worth, and I had a chance to look at his little pamphlet he put together for us, and I just brought memories back of uh, people like Norm Nice and folks like that who were not nice at all. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's kind of overwhelming for me to be back here in Seattle. I left in 1999 after living here for 10 years and um, from the ages of 25 to 35. I'm going to go over my 10 minutes. I'm just going to tell you right now. So <laughs> deal with it. Deal with it, okay. Okay, yeah, I think I'm going <clears> to... <throat> No, it's not, it's not, it's not going to happen. And uh, this was a time, a lot of folks uh, were here uh, in Seattle who were in the room. It was an unbelievable time for media and activism. And I really don't know what's been happening in the town in the last 20 years because I moved around the U.S. and I've been, been living in Berlin, Germany since 2005. So I, I'm out of touch with what's been happening. I assume that there's a lot of the fights are still going on, new fights, uh, transformations of old fights, a lot of the same people doing the fights, and I hope a lot of new people doing the fights. But just the, the folks up here at this table and people like Kent Chadwick and Lance Scott, Nick Licata, John Fox, um, a lot of other folks, uh, Eric Sigliano, who was the editor of the Seattle Weekly, who let me write this, um, tracked in 1998, 20 years ago. Uh, Peter Steinbrook, jo um, Rick Arambaru, Doug Collins, and the Washington Free Press, those folks, and a lot of folks who we've lost, uh, Walt Crowley, Charlie Chong, Irv Pollock, um, people who I got to know and, and were very inspirational. So I, I just want to say that, that my time in Seattle was, was hugely uh, gratifying and important in, in my life. And, the, a lot of the work that we did would not have been possible without people like John pushing us, digging up the dirt. Actually, I have a shovel that Charlie Chong gave me that says dirt digger on it. It's in my backpack. I want to show it to you. Franz, can you, oh, Franz has his headphones on. Uh, Nick pushing us to, to write about the things that, that were being discovered. And in the mid-late 90s, it was the Pacific Place, Nordstrom, Frederick and Nelson, parking garage, retail center, mall atrocity that I worked a lot on while working for the Seattle Weekly. And um, I don't have to go over all the history of what that project is or was, but this was a $400 million retail project that was backed by $144 million of taxpayer-backed loans. And when I went back, I have all the articles that, that we wrote for the Weekly and for the Washington Free Press, for The Stranger. Notice I'm not mentioning the Times and PI because they came very late to the party. They did not write about what was going on in a timely fashion. And over the period of about two years, thanks to people like John and Nick and uh, Rick Arambaru, Jordan, uh, Jordan Brower, FOIA's digging through records at City Hall, myself, other folks, just found out an unbelievable, and it's funny because in this article I wrote, Who Runs Seattle, the first line is, it's not a conspiracy, but this is how Seattle works. This was a conspiracy, and I don't use that word lightly, but when I went back and read all the, all the articles that we read, uh, I, I'm astonished that this kind of behavior could, could go on. In order for the project to happen, uh, Pine Street had to be reopened, which was something that the government previously had been against. So this was put on the ballot in a referendum that was backed by uh, wealthy interests and manipulated by wealthy interests. 
the uh, city actually said that by opening Pine Street, that, that actually would not improve the traffic flow to downtown. So this is one, one of many misrepresentations that were, that were put forth at the time. Um, there were lots of interconnected players that worked on the project, which was the, 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 the eventually became the impetus to write this, this Who Runs Seattle article. For example, a fellow named Jay Rich, who was the bond attorney for the state uh, Housing Finance Commission, which is like the state version of HUD, and the Housing Finance Commission gave a low interest loan to build a parking garage for $47 million. And then we found, found out that the city paid $73 million for the parking garage. So there was a huge overpayment for the parking garage, which I'm not sure if that's ever been explained or not. But lo and behold, Jay Rich, who, was, who wrote the bond documents to fund the parking garage, was a law partner um, for the lead attorney who represented the developer who built the whole project, Jeff Rhodes. And Jay was also uh, a key campaign official on many political campaigns, including for Mark Sidron and Gary Locke, who was a governor at the time. So we, we discovered an astonishing uh, interconnection of, of folks working on, on the project, a lot of which, which came out. Um, and the consultant who worked on this stuff was a guy named John Finke. And I don't know if John Finke's still around, but this guy, uh, was paid $120,000 $120, in fees from the garage overpayment, and then he went on to profit by building the parking garage. He got a half a million dollars for that. So it was, there were incredible conflicts of interest in the course of the, of the project. Also for the, the project to have gone through, the state had to pass a law to exempt a certain type of HUD loan from a constitutional ban on cities extending credit to private companies. Uh, and that was, that was a tasty little, that was uh, Senate Bill 5211. So they had to change the Constitution to allow for the, 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 the city to use HUD money to go into the project. This is my favorite. The city made up fake crime statistics. In order to qualify for this HUD loan, the city had to say that there was spot blight, whatever spot blight is, some kind of a blighted area. So they said, oh, there's all this blight around the empty Frederick and Nelson building. But they put in shoplifting statistics uh, to support the argument that was spot blight. Well, the building was closed. There was no shoplifting even going on. <laughs> and they made up other fake stats to show. And this was, this was the smoking gun. If, if they could not show spot blight around the Frederick and Nelson building, the city, led by Mayor Rice, could not have gotten the HUD loan. Doug Collins, my friend from the Washington Free Press, I assume from records that Nick got or Peter Steinbrook or Rick Arambaru found out that the crime stats were fake. And when they readjusted the crime stats by taking out the fake stats, it showed there was no increase in crime at all around the FNN building and there was no spot blight, yet the loan went ahead and, and went through. Another one of my favorites is we found some, again, from the work by John and Nick and everybody else, that there was a city official named Chuck DePew who had, given, who had given notes to city council members to coach them on how to behave at the city council meeting where the whole project was uh, approved on April 4th of 1994. For example, Mr. DePew wrote to the city council, don't mention Nordstrom. Don't mention Nordstrom? Embellish the decay of the Frederick and Nelson building. Choreograph unanimous, this is his words, choreograph unanimous support, which they did. It passed 9 nothing or whatever it was, 7 nothing. Don't ask questions about the loan to Jeff Rhodes. Jeff Rhodes was a developer from Chicago. I'm not making this shit up. And this is my favorite. Avoid linking the Frederick and Nelson building to the parking garage. Well, that was the whole damn thing. That was the whole damn thing, and they went along with it. The city council went along with it, and they followed the, the marching orders. And the amazing thing is that you're seeing private interests telling the public officials what to do, and the public officials saying, okay. Um, so much, I hate the word lies, but there were so many lies put forth in, the, in this project. It's, 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 and these are just the ones, 
all the stuff I'm telling you right now is just the stuff that we found out about, that we were able to write about. And I was only a freelancer at the Weekly. I wasn't even working on the staff there. And the Free Press was a very small publication that, that didn't have any money. Eat the State, same thing. KCMU, no money uh, at this radio station. Um, the, the deal for the whole thing was sealed over a private dinner with Norm Rice, Jeff Rhodes, and the Nordstroms, no public debate uh, until, until the choreographed meeting in April two, uh, 1994. Um, the, that meeting was covered by a PI reporter and a Seattle Times reporter, Jim Erickson from the PI and Peter Lewis from the Times. They covered a meeting actually in June 1995. And at that meeting, Margaret Pageler and Jay Noland publicly complained about the overpayment on the parking garage. Why are we spending $23 million more, the city, why is the city spending $23 million more on a parking garage from what it's actually, what it costs to build? These reporters were at the meeting and they didn't write about it. Later, when, when I called, I called Peter Lewis and I wrote an article about it. I called Peter, I said, why didn't you fix this later on? He said, well, it was too late to fix, so I didn't bother writing an article to, 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 fix, to, to fix the thing. It's true. And he also said that about fixing the fake crime stats. They didn't go back and fix that either. Um, there were 10 memos that the city refused to give federal investigators from HUD, including memos entitled Parking Garage Costs, Parking Garage Briefing, FNN Negotiations, Frederick and Nelson, Status of Garage Negotiations, and these were memos from the city finance director and one from Jane Nolan. These were 10 memos that the city wouldn't give to federal investigators. So you can imagine what, what was in these little tasty items. Um, and then of course the, uh, the overpayment for the parking garage. I know Nick tried to find out where did this money go. We got an internal budget on the parking garage which cost 50 million to build roughly and the city paid 73 million dollars for this thing and I don't know we I could not find out where the money went and again this is what we've been just been able to find out at the time with with no budgets no money no nothing people have gone to prison for far less than this and since I left Seattle and moved to Europe I do a lot of work in the Balkans in the former uh, uh, Yugoslav countries I go to Eastern Europe I go to Africa I go to parts of Asia to, to Latin America they lock people up in countries like that for far less than this. So um, the problem was is that this, sto this story came out drip, drip, drip in the Seattle Weekly and because I was not a staff writer there, I never got it on the cover. So it didn't get the proper attention in order to really get to the bottom of it. Um, there were many investigations into the, I'm, I'm wrapping up here and then I'll get to the grand point. There were many investigations that were done at the local, state, and federal level, thanks to John Fox, and Jordan Brower, and Nick Licata, and Peter Steinbrook, and Rick Arambaru, and all the articles that we managed to write. The, and these investigations happened in rapid succession. The uh, state attorney general concluded that the State Housing Finance Commission, which gave a low-income a low, uh, low interest loan to build a parking garage when the money should have gone to help build low income housing. The state AG finally concluded that, they, that the city should eliminate appearances of conflict of interest. Well, that's, that's a helpful, that's helpful. Uh, pretty hard hitting stuff. Um, an internal HUD memo that we found uh, during the whole negotiation said that the case may be weak, the case that the that federal money should be used to build a parking garage and a, and a shopping center. So there was a lot of I internal doubt about the project even at HUD when it was being negotiated. Uh, the Inspector General of HUD concluded the city's actions gave the appearance that it was purposefully keeping certain facts from the public and questioned whether the project had a public purpose. So when federal government people say something that nuanced, and cautious, you know what they're really saying? They're really saying that this was a scam. The deputy director of, of HUD said that city officials, quote, tried to obfuscate the true purpose of the use of the loan, of, of the, I'm sorry, tried to obfuscate the true purpose of the use of the loan funds. 
That's what the deputy director of HUD said. Why did the loan go through? Why wasn't any of the money paid back? Why isn't anybody in prison right now? Governor Locke finally had to, was forced to say that the state loan for the parking garage was inappropriate. The city ethics director found that two city officials, this Chuck DePew character who wrote the uh, coaching memo to the city council and Mary Jean Ryan had violated federal, state, and local laws. So if anybody, I don't know if anybody got in trouble or not, but, but this, 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 this was, uh, and I didn't see, really see the totality of these lies, conflicts, uh, uh, secrets, until I went back and read all the articles that I dug out of my basement last week um, before coming to. So um, in conclusion, I know that's a lot to absorb, but look, this is just what we found out. I'm sure Nick found out a lot more being on the city council for many years. And actually, the last article I wrote for the weekly, the last article I wrote for the weekly, I think in the fall, in the spring of 1998, said that uh, Nick and Peter were still trying to investigate what was happening with the, with the whole scam. But long story short, in many countries where I work now, there are citizen watchdogs that track procurement, that track as many public contracts as possible. And I don't know if there's a capacity in Seattle for this kind of thing, but there really needs to be a local NGO, maybe working with uh, uh, some researchers or even some academics to dig into all big public um, procurement, public works projects. I know that's a big order in a city the size of Seattle, which is growing. But this is a, this is a conspiracy. I mean, this is a criminal conspiracy. People intentionally withholding documents lying, keeping stuff from the public. Uh, and, you know, I used to feel bad that Norm Rice, is, when this was happening, Norm Rice was a candidate to be the secretary of HUD under Clinton. And one of the reasons he didn't get the job is because of this scandal was happening and HUD was investigating it. So you don't want a guy to run a federal agency that he just defrauded. I mean, you, 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 don't, you don't really want that. That, that's, that, that's not good, you know? And I, I always felt bad because I remember when the, all these articles were coming out, I was young and stupid. I called Wolf Blitzer and tried to get it on CNN. It was this big deal. And there, was, there actually was an article in the Washington Post about Rice being investigated, the, the, the uh, background check, because he was, a, he was a cabinet post candidate. It was either gonna be him or Cuomo to be the head of HUD. And two black-suited investigators came to my apartment when I was living in Ballard and knocked on the door and came in and asked me all kinds of questions about Norm Rice and what was he doing with the HUD thing. And I told him everything I knew. And there was an article in the Washington Post and Mayor Rice did not get the job as HUD secretary. And I always felt bad about that. Oh, no, wow. I did. Oh, I, cause, cause, I mean, <laughs> journalists are not supposed to want anything. We just tell the truth and get the facts out. I didn't, I didn't have a goal and I, I know that John Fox did not have a goal of keeping Mayor Rice from becoming the HUD secretary. <laughs> Come on, he's a nice guy. Well, I know that Norm did blame John for not getting the Probably, <laughs> but I think, Norm, I, think Mr. I think the mayor got a pretty good job with the, uh, uh, with the Federal, Federal, Federal Reserve. Reserve. Uh, Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae. But I actually, looking back on it, given, given what Mayor Rice did, what he knew he was doing, and all the staff, a lot of people had to keep this a secret because it went on, the, the planning, the negotiations, all the documents, the applications to HUD, the applications to the Housing Finance Commission. And I gotta tell you something, I know I'm way over, I really don't care. Uh, <laughs> I had gone in, no, this is my last, I had gone into the Housing Finance Commission. Again, this is like the state version of HUD. I went in there for something totally unrelated to look up a file about something. And it was at the time when this whole thing was coming out. And at that time, no one knew that they had loaned money to Jeff Rhodes to build a parking garage. No one knew that. And I went in and I said, oh, uh, I'm here to see the file. And they said, oh, about the parking garage? <laughs> And I turned into John Lovitz, uh, yeah, the parking garage, that's the ticket. 
And I didn't even know what they were talking. So I said, yeah, the parking garage, yeah, that file. And they gave me this file that showed me that they had actually gotten a loan to build a parking garage with state low-income housing funds. And that's how that whole story came out. So again, I don't know about the capacity, but Seattle needs a, and maybe if it's cleaner now, if this wouldn't happen today, then <laughs> mission accomplished. You know, if this, and I don't know if this, if, this, if, these, if this scandal sent a message to folks not to try it again, but I would strongly recommend a citizens group to come together and pick one project a year that doesn't look right. This never looked right. The Times didn't write about it. The PI didn't. We all wrote about it. We all wrote about it. And we had no resources, nothing. So you can do a lot with nothing. Um, I encourage you folks to get together and set up a, a monitoring function to check these contracts, to check these, these projects, and make sure that this thing, which was a conspiracy, doesn't happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, our next speaker is Maria. Yes. I'm Maria Tomchik. And uh, I'm going to show you that uh, actually city officials didn't really learn anything <laughs> from the Pacific Place garage. I'm going to talk about the Yesler Terrace redevelopment. And I'm going to start off with a little bit of history of Yesler Terrace. It was built in 1939 with about $3 million in federal money from the Roosevelt administration to help get the estimated four to 5,000 homeless people living in Hoovervilles in the city uh, into permanent housing. Yesler Terrace became the nation's first racially integrated public housing project designed specifically for families. So there were multiple bedrooms in a lot of these uh, uh, units. There were front and back yards where people could have their kids play or they could plant gardens or whatever people do with their front and back yards. Uh, in the 1970s, however, we're going to skip ahead quite a bit, the federal government stopped providing funding in general for maintenance of public housing projects. And those public housing projects around the nation began to deteriorate because there was just no money to do repairs, replacements, upgrades, etc. cetera. Uh, this led to the move to get quote, quote unquote, get rid of the projects uh, by doing what is often referred to as revitalizing the neighborhood. Uh, integrating people by income level rather than by race. So instead of going to wealthy neighborhoods and saying we're going to build affordable housing there, they said let's take this land that is uh, assessed at a very low value, very cheaply, or in some cases completely off the market like public housing is in a lot of public housing projects, and we will get private developers involved to build a mix of market rate housing and then housing for people at different level, income levels. Uh, so what happened, of course, is a lot of these poor neighborhoods and these quote unquote projects became redeveloped and gentrified in that, pro in that process. So I want to talk about how that's playing out in Seattle, how that's played out in Seattle. Starting in, I think it was about the early 1990s, the Seattle Housing Authority, which is a public corporation. It's not a part of city, state, or federal government, but it works very closely with the city, with city government, has owned and managed four large housing communities in Seattle. Yesler Terrace, which is the biggest one in their first project, about 28 acres uh, east of I-5 around Yesler Way, uh, Holly Park, which is now called New Holly, that's on Beacon Hill, uh, High Point in West Seattle, and Rainier Vista, which is west of Rainier Avenue South, just north of the Columbia City Business District. SHA has redeveloped all of these over time, uh, starting, uh, I think, with the first one, I think, was Rainier Vista and New Holly about the same time. Uh, and then High Point and now Yesler Terrace. And how they went about this is they came up with a plan to sell at least half of the land. And this land was public housing land. It was removed from the tax rolls. It was owned by SHA. It was not commercial or it was not zoned for anything but public housing. Okay. 
they would they would go to the city the city uh, council would pass uh, zoning changes and start working on the permitting process so that SHA could sell at least half of the land to private developers to build a majority of market rate units with a few usually around 20 percent of units set aside for people who make 80 percent of median income and just so you know what I'm talking about Median income for a single person in the city of Seattle now is 70,250. Although I think once the numbers are run for 2018, it's probably gonna be closer to $80,000 for median income. Uh, low income housing, when they, they talk about different levels of low income housing, there's low income housing, there's very low income housing, and extremely low income housing. Low income housing, which is sometimes now called workforce housing, as if people who are very low income don't work, uh, is 80% of median income, which is now set at 56,200, although it's gonna be closer to 60 to 64, I think, this next year. Very low income is 60% of median income. That's now 42,000, about $42,000. And extremely low income is, is when you make 30% or less of median income. And that's currently set at about 21,000, although I think in next year it'll be closer to 23,000. Now, people who make minimum wage in the city of Seattle, that's minimum wage is set at 11.50 to 15.45 an hour, depending on whether you work for a small company or a large company, uh, means that you're making about 23,000 uh, to about $32,000 per year if you're working full-time. If you're not able to get full-time hours at your workplace, you're making well under $23,000 a year. So you fall into that category of extremely low income. The kind of person who could easily become homeless in our current uh, housing environment and that's the kind of folks that public housing was meant for. People who work at very low wage jobs or can't get full time hours, who are disabled, who have uh, uh, mental issues, people who are seniors and not in the workforce anymore, anymore and are on a limited fixed income. Those are the folks that public housing has historically served. So SHA, going back to what they're doing in Seattle, they sell about half of the land and then they use that money from the sale of the land to build units for the extremely low income families. That's the idea, right? But not enough units really to replace the ones that were there in the public housing project before. So for example, in New Holly, it originally had 896 units of public housing for people at the extremely low end of the spectrum. The redevelopment built only 530 units to replace those for extremely low income people. And there were other units for people higher on the income scale, but not enough to replace what was there before for the extremely low income people who are historically served by public housing. High Point in West Seattle, when it was first built in the 40s, had 1,300 units of public housing. A bunch of them had been allowed to deteriorate and been closed over time but the redevelopment set aside zero units for people making 30% of median income, not a single one. There were 425 units for people making 60% of median. But again, you might not be able to afford that if you make minimum wage. Rainier Vista had 481 units of public housing left as of 1995. After the redevelopment, only 351 units were guaranteed for extremely low-income residents. Um, and there were more units, of course, for people making higher uh, wages. So Yesler Terrace, SHA has or is in the process of selling more than half of the land to private developers. And when you look at a map of Yesler Terrace, if you could see a color-coded map, you would see mostly private land north of Yesler. It's been sold off or is in the process of being sold off. South of Yesler, two to three large tracts of land which have been, al have been already sold and are currently being developed. Now, Vulcan gets a lot of the uh, media attention here because they uh, bought 3.7 acres in three parcels for $21.5 million. That's a little under $6 million per acre. And keep that number in mind here to build 
an estimated 650 to 700 units total, but only 20% of those units will be for people making 80% of median income. None for people making 60 in the, low, in the very low or people making 30% in the extremely low. And that's true for almost all of these private developments. It's all market rate and a few for people who make 80%. Uh, the first of these three buildings is now open, the Batik, and it's uh, renting one-bedroom units at $2,000 to $2,300 per month. Um, Two-bedroom apartments, which I guess you could argue uh, are for families, uh, rent at $3,100 to $3,400. The building and land, which, uh, which cost about a little under $6 million for them to buy, the building and land are now assessed at $41.5 million by uh, King County. Spectrum Development Solutions was the first private, private developer to buy in Yesler Terrace. They bought about a half an acre for $2.88 million. Their building, Anthem on 12th, I think was the first one to open, is now assessed at $43.6 million. It's uh, 120 units, 90 are market rate, and 30 units only for people who make 80% of median income. Mill Creek Residential, based in Dallas, bought 1.2 acres. This is interesting because they've worked very hard to keep the price that they've paid for that land secret. And it has, they have not registered the sale yet with King County, probably because they don't want to pay real estate taxes yet because they're not, they have not finished building on that land. But also it helps them to keep secret what they paid for that 1.2 acres. They're going to build a uh, Modera First Hill. And I don't know if you know about uh, apartment complexes opening up around Seattle. There's a Modera on Capitol Hill. There's a Modera South Lake Union. There's a Modera on 18th and Jackson. And all of these are very similar to the Vulcan development. They charge high market rate rents. And of course, there's only about 20% set aside for people who make 80%. Uh, of median income. And then the final developers, Low Enterprises, based in Los Angeles, they bought 2.5 acres for 32.2 million. That's almost $13 million an acre, about double what Vulcan paid. So you can see there that Vulcan got a little price discount, quite a bit of a price discount, for being one of the early developers and being a local company and knowing people at City Hall. They paid less than half of what Low Enterprises has paid to purchase their lots. SHA just recently in April listed 4.5 more acres for sale in the northernmost sections of the Yesler Terrace complex along Alder Street just south of Harborview. Uh, those parcels can be used for anything. There's no requirement. The way they're advertising is there's no requirement to build any low-income housing. Those uh, Parcels could be used for luxury apartments, they could be used for retail, or for the preferred use that uh, SHA is saying they want them to be used as office towers for uh, large office buildings so that they can make this uh, neighborhood a live-work environment. That's what they say. Of course, they could get some prime money for uh, land that would be for office towers. And they are marketing them not just for a national, to national real estate companies, but they're marketing them internationally as well. So uh, I want to also remind you too that for each of these properties, SHA has paid to tear down the buildings that were there and to grade the land. So typically when a developer buys a unit to tear down, they buy as is, and then they have to put up the money to tear down the buildings and grade the land. But in this case, that's not happening. SHA is paying to do all that. Um, and the number of units for extremely low income residents that SHA will build on the remaining about four and a half to five and a half acres that they have kept from this 28 to 29 acre uh, community to build very low income housing is only 218 units that have been built and designed so far to replace the 591 units that were there before that housed about 1,100 low income people, extremely low income people. So even though they say we're replacing them one for one, you know, they've got one more 
building left to design and they're going to have to take it really high and design it to you know to to hold something like 300 or more extremely low income units and they're not going to do that so there's not going to be a one for one replacement just like there wasn't for any of the other uh, SHA properties that have been redeveloped and of course the vast majority of the units that have been built so far even the ones that are for extremely low income people are studio and one bedroom and maybe an occasional two bedroom apartment they're not a one-for-one one replacement for families who want a yard for their kids to play in, for immigrant families who uh, want to have a garden, maybe, with their unit, that's just not an equivalent replacement for them. And so SHA, who initially in 2011 said that the city and the, that the, that the, city would, and the federal government would not have to give any money to this project, that SHA could do it all, with their own funding and by selling parcels of land? Well, that's not true. Uh, SHA is using public taxpayer money for more than half of the project. Uh, federal, the federal government is giving them $33 million in HUD money. The city of Seattle is giving them $30 million. Some of it is from the Parks Fund to help build Yesler Park, but uh, also some of it is from the housing levy funds and from other city fund sources. Uh, and SHA expects to get $156 million in low-income housing tax credits, and that's going to be about 36% of the total funding for the project. And the rest, of course, is going to be land sales of about $144 million, maybe more. We'll have to see what those two parcels that were just listed on the market will go for, plus about $73 million in bond sales, bond debt. In addition, the city of Seattle had to approve, like I said, new zoning uh, for Yesler Terrace, a number of permits, and vacate a street for the 10th Avenue Hill Climb and Park, and there may be some more issues with, street, uh, with the streets in that area, too, because I think they're going to be doing improvements for South Washington Street through the uh, park and, and around some of the private development that's south of Yesler. Um, and then there's the First Hill Streetcar. That is a key part, piece of the government infrastructure that has made the redevelopment work. The main stop that serves the Yesler Terrace community is at Yesler and Broadway, uh, directly adjacent to the Vulcan parcels. There are three Vulcan parcels. is directly adjacent to the middle one that they purchased along Yesler. Uh, the total cost of the First Hill Streetcar line was $134 million, and it costs the city, and well, the city pays about $6 million a year to operate both the South Lake Union Streetcar and the First Hill Streetcar because they will probably never pay for themselves. The Central City Connector Streetcar line is really key to connecting that workforce housing that's being built in Yesler Terrace uh, to downtown businesses in South Lake Union. And you can see by looking at the, some of the buildings that have been built in Yesler Terrace that it's really being marketed towards tech workers and, and really is something that only they can afford. That, uh, city, that center city connector streetcar line is over budget at $200 million to build it along First Avenue. And uh, King County Metro is estimating it'll cost $24 million a year to operate just the city connector part of the streetcar line. So the overall impact of the Yesler redevelopment is, is a major gift to real estate developers, especially to Vulcan, but to the other developers as well, who it appears, of course, Vulcan, appear, it appears they now got their property at a 50% discount. Uh, in a, and in addition to market rate housing, SHA's plan is for private developers to gain 88,000 square feet of retail space and 900,000 square feet of office space. And if you could convert that into housing units, you could be housing about 1,500 people, maybe more than that if you have more than one person per unit. Um, and uh, then also, you know, the city of Seattle's own requirements for affordable housing has led to some of this some of this as being a, a, real, a really big problem because they've been completely inadequate to the need. Um, the city of Seattle requires developers in just five areas of the city right now 
uh, and that's set to expand when the city passes uh, revisions to, to their um, development code to build some units for people who make 60% of median income or else pay a small tax into the city's housing fund, uh, most developers have been opting to pay the tax, not to build the units. And then if you see land that's been already removed from the, um, land that's already been, been removed and set aside for public housing, which is what Yesler Terrace was, it was not uh, on it was not on the retail land rolls. If you look at that, and then you look at that versus the city going around like, like it is right now, trying to find affordable land to build shelter space just to get homeless people off the street, or to build land for affordable housing to try to buy that at retail price is outrageous in today's market. And yet we see this land being given, largely given away to these developers they t it takes them about a year to build, and then the land is suddenly double or triple what they paid for it. It seems like a crying shame. Now, we keep hearing over and over again about the number of homeless people in Seattle that the one-night count of the homeless found about 12,000 homeless people in King County, the majority of them in the city of Seattle. And uh, you start to wonder, w w you look at Yesler Terrace, you start to wonder, what are the priorities here? Well, clearly the priorities are to uh, give developers a big gift so that they can, quote unquote, revitalize, in other words, gentrify the First Hill neighborhood and drive a lot of the people who were formerly living there to Kent and, and Auburn and places outside of the city. So, um, okay, and I just wanna mention too, there's the perverse incentive to privatize public land is a key part of that. Because pub the pu this public property had been removed from the tax rolls, SHA does not pay any uh, real estate taxes, any sales taxes, because it's a public corporation in the state of Washington. Um, selling this land to private developers then means that state and city officials can say, oh golly, we're gonna get all this additional real estate, this additional revenue and real estate taxes and the developers will pay uh, sales taxes when they do their, when they build their, pro their, pro their uh, buildings, et cetera. So that provides this in perverse incentive for local officials to say, yeah, maybe it's better to privatize that land than to just let it sit there and stagnate. So that's, that's all I'm gonna say. Um, that's, that would be a great project for a citizens group that wanted to look at contracts because I'm sure there's gonna, that you would find a lot of back and forth there between, and conflicts of interest there between the developers on those projects, the people who designed the SHA project because they did not design it, they hired a, a private company to design it for them and uh, who actually profits. Thank you, Maria. And uh, who says that crime doesn't pay? You know, I mean, but just keep track of the people involved in all this land. You know, who was the first one? Norm Nice. Second is Norm Nice. He seems to have his hands into all this stuff. Thank you, George. I am George Howland, and um, I'm afraid I'm not going to uh, end the panel on an upbeat note. Uh, so, but I am going to be the first uh, member of the panel to get to uh, the 10 figures, the $1 billion in public money being poured into South Lake Union. And uh, back uh, in the old days, um, a neighborhood called Cascade was ho a home to many uh, low-income residents as well as uh, many uh, small manufacturing, warehousing jobs, blue collar jobs. And uh, a Seattle Times newspaper columnist, John Hintenberger, looked out from his office window and said, we should raise this area and make a big park. Uh, a pitch man named Joel Horn uh, came to town and said, by golly, we're gonna do this. We're calling it the Seattle Com Commons and they approached one of the richest uh, men in the world, uh, our very own billionaire Paul Allen, and said, 
hey, would you buy some land in this neighborhood? And, um, you know, as part of the effort to get the Seattle Commons things rolling, Paul Allen bought uh, 11 acres and Seattle Commons failed and then Paul Allen bought 50 more acres to re uh, bring his holdings to about 60 acres. Now, this area had to be redeveloped and poor Paul Allen could not pay for it all himself. Uh, it just wouldn't be fair for a billionaire to have to pony up money to support his own development project. So he went to work on local politicians and he really found his chief uh, cheerleader in Mayor Greg Nichols. And the pitch was, we're going to have this be all biotech. Remember that? Biotech. Okay, so um, they start to move the projects forward. Um, and uh, Maria already mentioned one of them, the streetcar. Uh, that little dinky line that runs from West Lake to South Lake Union is of no use for, uh, no utility for public transit. Uh, even now with all the thousands of people that, that uh, work in South Lake Union, they don't get enough riders to pay for the damn thing. Uh, and um, we're still subsidizing it uh, heavily when we were promised, oh, it's going to pay for itself, we're going to have advertising, the ridership numbers are going to be so great. Then uh, Paul Allen felt that in order to develop really nice properties along Mercer Street and along um, uh, next to the lake, uh, you really needed to change those, uh, the way those streets are configured. $300 million later, uh, we now have the same line of traffic that we had before getting onto the freeway. A uh, recent uh, study showed it's gotten three seconds faster. Um, and, and Paul Allen has a beautiful uh, street uh, next to uh, Lake Union on which to do his development. And he has a very nice boulevard there on which, uh, you know, the sides of which are all uh, large buildings. And uh, it just looks terrific. Now, to make things look even better, they felt that you really needed to take all the overhead power lines that are such a blot on, on the world and bury them. So uh, we paid $100 million to bury them. Uh, they also decided, you know, we're not getting the kind of power that we really feel that we need. There's some surges sometimes. It's not really good service. So we're building them a new city light substation to the tune of 200 million dollars. Uh, we also fixed up the park uh, for uh, 20 million dollars uh, and um, Paul Allen has had a field day. Now biotech didn't come, right? What came? Amazon, right? Okay, so suddenly we're subsidizing uh, Jeff Bezos and Amazon uh, and you know uh, we were told all along by politicians, well you know what? It's going to be really great because these new corporations, when they move in, these new companies, they're going to pay a lot of taxes and we'll, we'll redirect that into the social services. Um, that was the whole theory of why we should put a billion dollars into this neighborhood for a billionaire. Okay, so uh, last year, 2017, I noticed that for the first time, Amazon was spending heavily in local elections. Uh, they put $350,000 into the Chamber of Commerce's PAC. Previously, they had donated nothing to politics in town. And I thought, well, what the hell is that about? Stupid me, right? What it was about was about the head tax, the way that Amazon was actually going to have to pay some taxes. As you probably know, in uh, 2017, uh, Amazon... Uh, uh, had a profit of three billion dollars and they paid zero dollars goose egg in federal taxes. When the city council decided okay we're gonna make you pay 12 million dollars a year to uh, help support the house to help ameliorate 
the housing crisis that you created uh, by bringing in 45,000 high paid tech workers into the city, uh, therefore driving up rents and increasing homelessness, um, we're going to make you pay something back. Oh, oh no, 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 no. That, that's not going to work, right? So they turned on the muscle and uh, they got their political machine cranking and what do you know? The city council <laughs> turned around and repealed the tax on a seven to two vote. So not only did we subsidize Paul Allen, but now we got to subsidize Amazon too. It's like two for, uh, two for one we're getting out of, uh, <laughs> out of all of this uh, investment we put into South Lake Union. Uh, so the fight goes on against corporate welfare. Uh, it's very unacknowledged, unfortunately, as uh, previous speakers have mentioned uh, by the local press. Uh, there are uh, a, a small number of activists that keep trying to beat it back. A few elected officials come along now and then, like Nick Licata, who try to beat it back. But they're outnumbered, and uh, it's a very uh, discouraging time in Seattle uh, for the battle against corporate welfare. Thank you.